Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Leslie Karen Johnson. It's really good to be with you this afternoon. I um, just want to check before we go ahead if everybody can hear me, if my sound is clear. Um, if, you, if you're not sure or you're having some, some problems there on the technical side, give us a shout on the chat line. Um, you'll see you have a, an option um, to, to chat with us and send us some chats. And also, um, just as a point, um, oh, great, well done, Renee, thank you. Also, as a point, if you have a question, um, please type it in the questions tab on that sidebar instead of the chat. It might just get lost in the chat. And obviously, if there's some great questions, we want to try and address them while we're online as well. Great. So thanks for joining me. And we're going to kick off. Um, the topic today is sort of changing gears in this sort of time of lockdown and pandemics and all these other wonderful things we're having to live through, this new normal. I can't handle those two words, but that's what it is. Um, we are looking at ways to adapt our businesses so that we can still make money during these uncertain times and being sort of relatively uncertain as to where we're all going and where the world and our businesses and our lives are headed, hopefully one day soon post lockdown and post pandemic. And the three questions that we're going to look at um, over the course of the next 20 minutes deal with fundamentally changing your business or making changes in your business but still managing costs. How do you go about doing that? Um, I know a lot of people, um, when times are tough or their business is not doing well and they know they need to adapt and change, they just don't know where to start. It's a bit of that deer in the headlights kind of um, scenario. And then obviously, you know, when we, when we make changes or big changes to the business, sometimes it's easier to look for the low hanging fruit, the quick wins um, and, and, and try and make those smaller, simpler changes, because not only do you get your, your potential customers or clients to buy into that, but sometimes that's easier for your staff to deal with, um, especially where you've got a, a workforce that needs to adapt as well. And I thought, as opposed to me sitting and kind of talking at you and trying to answer these, these questions or these points, is to present some answers to you by way of case studies. And I had the pleasure of interviewing a few business people over the last couple of weeks and getting some of their inputs and how they've coped with moving on and moving through lockdowns and, and, and this kind of new normal. I call it business unusual because it's very odd for me still after all these months. So let's kick off. Here's a, a, the first example. Um, and I've called this from spray paint manufacturer to contract pa packaging. And this effectively is a Durban-based um, company that manufactures spray paint, supply, supplies spray paint to the big corporates, to Game, to Checkers, Hyper, ShopRite, um, to Macro. And effectively, going into, into lockdown, the beginning of this year, um, they were worried about their business. Um, they weren't sure they were going to actually survive. And then, of course, horrors of horrors, lockdown hit us. And um, because hardware and paint was not essential services, they did not get one single order for paint for April. And of course, we literally got to the point where they thought they were going to have to close their business down. Two things happened for them. First of all, South Africa kind of ran out of plastic spray bottles um, and, and similar packaging. If you remember at the time, we were all running around frantically looking for spray bottles to put our disinfectant and our sanitizers in. And an existing company, quite a large company, who was um, packaging aerosol products was not kind of meeting customer expectations and fulfilling promises to their customers. And as a result of those two kind of, I called it the perfect storm when I spoke to him, as a result of those two um, things happening, uh, they suddenly realized that they could accommodate some of these, these manufacturers who were manufacturing sanitizers, et cetera, and package their products for them. And it was literally from a, a cost point of view, it was literally taking the existing equipment and they just had to allow for different uh, gas. So for example, when you're bottling or, or putting spray paint into cans, into aerosol cans, you use LPG gas. You can't do that with, with certain other products. So they had to find some options. But all they did was then adapt the equipment and machinery so that they could unplug one type of gas and plug another type in. And um, as a result of that, have picked up phenomenal contracts. Um, they've actually had their best months in May and June. And um, it's got to the point where the sanitizer in the aerosol cans is accounting for 50% of their business. Um, obviously, they have started stocking spray paint, et cetera, again, into their, into their supplies. But also, the, the added advantages of this was as opposed to waiting 60 to 90 days for payment from the big retailers, some of their, their new clients are actually paying them COD. So that's done marvelous things for their cash flow, as you can imagine. And what they're basically doing now is going into, into sort of 
hopefully post lockdown at, at, at sometime soon, they're wanting to identify further opportunities for contract packaging and start uh, allowing their business to, to kind of find a, a, a 60 40 split between contract packaging, i.e., the, the sanitizers, um, and obviously products beyond sanitizer. They're looking at, at for example, the spray cans that they spray um, in the airlines, in the, in the airplanes. Um, apparently, a lot of the airlines aren't happy with the product they're using and are looking for options. So they're looking to see what they can do in that regard. And hopefully, come up with some solutions to, to some of these problems and um, be able to grow the, the, the contract packaging side of the business to 60% of the business as opposed to um, you know, focusing on, on paint manufacturing and, and bottling. Another one, uh, another company I spoke to, and sorry if I feel like I'm rushing through this, but we've got short time, so I'd rather get through it and then you could ask questions as well. Another company I spoke to um, is a company who provides training. And um, effectively before lockdown, I've given you a little bit of a, a, a summary there. She was doing face-to-face -face training, so either one-on-one -on -one or in groups of about eight to ten um, uh, um, customers or people coming in to be trained. Um, she had her, her training facility um, in Johannesburg, so she was very limited in terms of where she was attracting her customers and her, her people from. Um, her classroom size and parking constraints, et cetera, obviously presented some, some problems. So she was kind of, you know, she was, there was always a maximum number of people she could train at any given time. She lost time between lessons in terms of travel time, allowing people to come in and out of the facility, et cetera, um, and, and just sort of the convenience factor for people. And um, although she was doing occasional training online, um, it was more sort of one-on-one -on -one online training, and she was doing that through Skype. Going forward, she had to make a quick change around um, so that she could still accommodate all her customers. And um, the only expense that she um, incurred literally going forward was that she had to purchase a Zoom license or a Zoom plan um, so that she had a reliable platform to do it. And she tried a number of platforms and has decided that Zoom is the one that works for her. But she's literally moved her entire business online. And because of that, she now has a, a national footprint. And I'll tell you, I actually um, use this lady. I'm, I'm doing Portuguese lessons with her. And where I was in a class of eight to 10 people, we're now in a class of 18 online people. So it's phenomenal how just those extra people, I mean, that's covered that Zoom license, I don't know, probably three or four times over just with my group, um, never mind all the other groups that she's doing. Obviously, this allows for a, a more national footprint. So she's now attracting people. We've got people from Cape Town and um, Pretoria on this course. And um, it's just more efficient. So much more gets done in the two hours online than what was happening in the classroom setup. And um, now she's basically also free to offer refresher courses to her past clients or customers um, without worrying about them taking up the space of paying customers. So it's just, it's been an all round benefit for her going online. And I also spoke to another um, business, another woman who's got a business in the training space. She actually trains in the franchising sector. And thankfully, she'd kind of prepared her business due to personal um, sort of issues that happened in her life. She prepared her business to go into the online space quite some time before COVID. Um, so she was almost prepared for this without blinking. And um, she got everybody to, to, you know, all her clients to start looking at online. And I think because of the fact that we, we went into lockdown, we all started having online meetings and meetings through Zoom and Google Hangouts and Teams and everything else. It, the adoption of, of online was that much, just that much quicker and that much easier for people to, to get to. So here's another example. This one's quite stunning. This is a um, interior design company. The, the actual company is called Luma Has It, and they developed a product called Design in a Box. So everything happens online. They have uh, some interactions with you. And um, once they've kind of obviously understood you and, and what you like and your, your sort of theme preferences and what colors you like, et cetera, they put together a package, they design your room and they put it in a box. And um, when they first, when we first went into lockdown, um, the, they, they sort of ran a promo on focusing on office, home office space, because obviously we're all working from home and that was quite a key thing. What they're now doing is um, they're getting a lot of requests for people to say, well, we live in open plan spaces. So how do we kind of have this beautiful designed connected open space? So the current package and offering that they're looking at is to deal with that. So they're constantly assessing and reviewing customer needs and, and inquiries. Um, and 
the one thing I got from them is that, that the trust in online is gathering momentum quite substantially. Um, and that's been quite exciting for them and to see the uptake of this online product as opposed to actually dealing with a, with a designer, an interior designer face to face. Another couple of examples, um, just to various people I've spoken to, an IT services and support company kind of pre-entered lockdown, obviously watching what was happening in the rest of the world, pre-entered lockdown and identified what the support employees would need to enable them to work from home. And like, you know, sort of in terms of um, connectivity, data, um, printers, laptops, the works, okay, what would they need? And they kind of made sure the guys were all equipped to be sent home to work from home prior to lockdown. They've had minimal retrenchments, as far as I understood, they, they, they did retrench a couple of people, but minimal retrenchments. And the move has actually been so effective for them um, to have their staff working remotely that they've decided for the most part they're going to continue with that. And they're looking at actually giving up the, the expensive office space um, and, and sort of really downsizing on that just to allow for an office um, sort of, you know, to have a, a physical office space, but to allow for more meetings as opposed to having a workforce working out of that office. Um, so there, the savings would be on monthly rental and related ops costs, but apparently from the feedback I've had, they seem to be getting quite a lot of productivity out of their guys working from home and, and, and working remotely. Um, somebody else I spoke to is in the PPE supply space um, and was doing quite a, quite a lot of business with some of the mines and some of the big corporates, but as you can imagine, and as you see on social media, this space has kind of become absolutely inundated with, with people offering uh, PPE. It's, it's just so overtraded. And he identified um, that there was a need to provide or offer a sanitizing fogging service. Um, and he found somebody who had a product, um, eco-friendly product, um, and has been now going into, into businesses and offering this product into and high traffic businesses, so your retail spaces, your malls. Um, your office spaces where you've got people coming back into the workforce, etc. Um, and what he's done there is he hasn't retrained staff. Instead of retrenching, he has retrained some of his staff um, to now go in and provide the um, the, the retrenching, uh, sorry, the fogging business, a uh, fogging service. And he's leveraging off existing clients and networks. So the guys he was supplying PPE to, he's now going and saying, well, we've got a nice add-on service. Um, and here's just a few more examples. I know of a, lamin a laminate manufacturer. Um, we're manufacturing laminate products for the, the, the construction and shop fitting trade. They're looking at potentially um, identifying hotels as a potential new market. If you think about hotels, have got all these soft furnishings and these plush finishes, which, you know, COVID-wise obviously is not ideal. Whereas if you had a laminate product as a headboard, it's quite easy to go in and, and your housekeeping staff to wipe it down and sanitize it. Um, you give your customers, the your guests, the, the satisfaction and um, the level of comfort that you're giving them a, a clean and sanitized room if they stay over. Sorbet, the personal beauty and, and, and healthcare retailers are obviously offering delivery service for retail products and offering a we come to you service so they'll come into your mani and pedi at home if you like. Furniture manufacturers and retailers obviously looking at a lot of home office solutions. So you can see that I've tried to give you a little bit of sort of going online and, and providing online services, but not every business is cut out to provide an online service. So some of the other sectors where we've started seeing growth, and I do a lot of work in the franchising sector, we've seen a hang of a lot of growth over the last short while in storage solutions, people downsizing, unfortunately being retrenched or losing their jobs and businesses, moving into smaller spaces, I've got all this furniture that they don't necessarily want to sell, so move it into, into personal storage solutions and uh, facilities. Delivery and courier services has sprung up second to none. Um, it's, it's just, and that's predominantly because of online and people preferring to have deliveries to their, their home, even your fast food and your orders and your shopping. So that one's quite big. Obviously, we've spoken a bit about internet and online. Um, cleaning and sanitizing services. And some of these might be short-term um, solutions, maybe for the next year, 24 months, some of them. But, you know, I think we've all got into the habit of sanitizing our hands and washing our hands I don't know that it's going to go away in a hurry. Um, and, and there's obviously still some, some chance of, of, of maximizing and, and, and leveraging off um, the need for people to sanitize and ensure a safe environment for their customers to come into. Um, occupational health and safety is another one, again, in, in line to our, current, uh, our current situation. And home improvements and upgrades, because we're all spending so much time at home, 
I think people are looking at their properties and their homes and also saying, well, how do we how do we improve our asset? How do we make our living space that much nicer to live in, etc.? So as a bit of a uh, sort of summing up, I hope I've, I've answered some of those questions, those three questions we started with. But if I can just summarize it in, in some critical um, um, takeaway points, and then maybe we can look to see if anybody has any questions. Um, look at your existing business. Look at what you ex you're doing. Start with what you know and identify if there are any add-on services that you could offer to your existing clients. It's such a nice way of maximizing and levering off your current client network. Um, do customer surveys and find out from your, your existing customers if there are any shortfalls in the, in the service of the product you're providing and what else you could do to provide a, a you know, complete or, or more holistic service to them. Assess the current resources that you have in the business. And I'll talk about equipment and people here. And see if you can refit or repurpose anything that um, you currently use. Like the guy with the spray paint, can you use your existing equipment to provide uh, or to offer a, a, another product or another solution to, to, to a client or to a, a range of clients? And I think when it comes to, as, as I said earlier, when it comes to implementing any changes, both from a system point of view, from processes point of view, look for the low-hanging fruit, look for the quick wins. Um, and, and almost like with marketing, you know, it's, it's some of it's trial and error. Get it out into the market and test it and see how it works for you. Because if it does work, great, we roll out, we go ahead and do it. If it doesn't work, you know you can change route or direction or, or your tactics quite quickly. And you know, very uh, I advise this with to a lot of staff, a lot of customers and clients that we deal with. Collaborate with your staff. They they often deal with your customers directly and know the frustrations or the issues your customers are having. And by collaborating with them, they actually might have some fantastic ideas that, that you can use and implement in the business. And also that helps them to, you know, gives them a level of comfort that you're trying to do things to make sure that this business survives and going into the future, your employees still have jobs. And of course, don't keep things a secret. Um, you no know, good coming up with wonderful ideas and, and new products or services or solutions for your, um, for your customers but um, you know, make sure you shout about what you're offering. And um, I think that's the, the critical thing is use social media. If you just think of what's been on social media in the last four months, um, and I can literally name them off the top of my head, so much home office stuff. Leroy Merlin um, do a whole stack of advertising around you know, make, a, make a coffee table, and then they tell you what you need. Hopefully you're gonna go into Leroy Merlin and buy what you need, or order it and have it delivered. Um, so think, think about how you can use social media. And there's a, there's a comment here from um, Meekness. Speed seems to be the key to clever pivoting. Indeed, uh, I think you've got to try and, and that's why, that's why we say look for the quick wins. Because if you can implement and roll out quickly, you know, you put yourself in a better position. So, so you know, yes, great, great question. Um, and, and make sure that you maximize the, the, the word getting out there. Use everything at your at your at your disposal. Social media, your website. Make sure that that's up to date um, and that it has all your latest information. If you're offering a, a, a delivery service, a home delivery service, make sure that it works. Make sure that you've got enough people delivering. Don't keep your customers waiting for an hour. I remember when we went into lockdown, the big retailers. Um, you would place an order. You were lucky if you got your groceries two weeks later. You know, preempt those kind of problems and try and make sure you put solutions in place that if, if issues arise, that you've got a, a, a plan B, a backup, that you can really maximize the, the, the offerings. Um, are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? I'll give you a couple of minutes. Um, but I, I hope I've answered in that kind of quick, quick session, I hope I've answered um, those three questions and those three issues. If you have any questions or any further questions, um, you can also obviously interact on the Simply Biz, Biz platform, um, or you can go to my website um, and, and send through some, some comments. Um, let's just have a look here. There's another chat that's come through. I just want to have a look. Um, okay, so just um, a message from Simply Biz. You can download and complete the three Get Into Gear assessments, and obviously then you can um, claim your free prize of my book, The NetBank Ultimate Business Companion Guide. And that's a book that's got forms and checklists and templates and everything that you literally need um, to help put your processes and your systems and procedures in place in your business. So I hope that was informative. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for, for joining me. And um, 
all the very best and, and good luck with, with implementing your new ideas and, um, you know, hopefully there's some exciting, exciting options and opportunities out there. Thank you, everybody.